Hopefully all of you, whether you're here or at home, are uh, safe right now. Um, I was studying the Bible this past week, and I was reminded of God's power, and that we can find him as his refuge and shelter. And the fact that we do not have to worry at all, because if God can so clothe the flowers, and if he could feed the birds, Jesus says, how much more will he take care of us? And I was also reminded of the fact that Paul was in prison. He was by himself for a very long time. He was, in a way, quarantined. And yet he wrote parts of the New Testament during that time. And I thought to myself, what am I doing, right? How can I be productive during this time? All very encouraging words from God. All great reminders. But right now, I would like for all of us to turn to Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. That is Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. We've been on the journey for uh, the past uh, two years or so in Luke, and we are finally at Luke 18. And the title of our message for today is Grasping Our King's Determination. That's Grasping Our King's Determination. If you're taking notes, the text is once again Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. Now, as I was finishing up my sermon uh, for my manuscript, I was trying to find stories on how to open up today, uh, today's passage that is connected with this uh, passage. That's about love and determination, because you'll see that in a bit. But as I was searching online, I realized, I think most of you know already these kind of stories of love and determination. They are the stories of your parents. Some of your parents came from Uh, China or Taiwan or different parts of the world. They came from rags, and when they come here to America, they worked so hard. They were determined to do whatever they can to pursue not just their American dream, but but to, to set their love on you as their child. They would pass out flowers as work. They would work in factories. Some of them work multiple jobs at once. And it's even harder if you only have one mom, a single mother, or if you only have a single father. Or maybe they would study hard at school with a language that they don't even know about. And some would work hard for years and decades for the purpose, for the very purpose of having you, regardless of the, the mental, emotional, physical pain they may, be, may have been going through, because they have determined from long ago that they are going to give you a happy life. When you were younger, You would see your parents doing certain things that you simply do not understand. You would ask, why? Why are you doing this? Why are you telling me to do this or telling me to not do this? And it's only until when you're older, perhaps much older, where you realized they were doing that because they love you. Maybe right now you have parents who are doing everything they can to keep you safe from the virus. 
they would go out on their own to buy things and would come back by themselves, risking their lives for you. Parents set their love for their children, for many of them, long before they were born. And they are loving you. They are determined to love you right now. There's someone else who is like this. But he is far greater than anyone. He was determined, he is determined, he is forever determined to love, to have this sacrificial love, regardless of the pain. This is no other than, of course, Jesus Christ, our King. In our passage today, the intent is to give you a peace of mind and to trust, to have an increased faith in your hearts when you do not understand the circumstances, just like how you were with your parents when you were younger. Our pastors today is to also remind ourselves of our great king. If you are feeling downtrodden, fearful, perilous, insecure, and you are not sure if you're understanding your circumstances right now, I want you to receive this text today. I want to see an aspect of God's love that's not always dwelt upon. I want you to see an aspect of God's mind we don't usually think about. Maybe we, some of you are joining in today and you're seeking for Jesus Christ. If you're that person, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34 as well. If you want to receive him as your Savior, continue to listen in. This passage, while short, it is deep. It is full of meaning. The more you read it, the more you understand this passage, the more gold you will find. Let's all go to Luke chapter 18, and let's begin at verse 31. The Bible says, And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered <coughs> over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them and they did not grasp what was said. In Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, Jesus reveals five qualities of his determination so that you may glorify the king even when you do not understand the situation. I'll say that one more time. In Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, Jesus reveals five qualities of his determination so that you may glorify the king even when you do not understand the situation. What are the five qualities of Jesus' determination? The first one is that Jesus is pointedly determined. He is pointedly determined. Number two, Jesus is completely determined. Number three, Jesus is 
knowingly determines. Number four, Jesus is trustingly determines. And number five, Jesus is unstoppably determines. So pointedly, completely, knowingly, trustingly, unstoppably determines. What was Jesus determined to do in this passage? If you look in the context, Jesus is determined to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Even the prophecies where it says that he has to die and to die in your place. Let's look at the first point. Jesus is pointedly determined. And this is found in the first part of verse 31 of Luke 18. Pointedly as in intentionally, with a singular destination in mind. Verse 31, the Bible says, And taking the twelve, he, Jesus, said to them, them being the disciples, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. Now, if we recall, rewind all the way back to Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Jesus, at that time, was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was on Mount Hermon. And after descending Mount Hermon in Luke 9, 51, the Bible says when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to to go to Jerusalem. He was determined to go to Jerusalem. The idea of determined in the Greek, well, the word is sterudzo. This is the idea to fix firmly, firmly establish, steadfastly set. Jesus was firmly established in his destination. At this point, we know Jesus was at least close to Mount Hermon in a village. Mount Hermon is a a 50-hour walk, or maybe a five-hour drive if Jesus had a car, from Mount Hermon to Jerusalem. From Mount Hermon to Jerusalem, Jesus accomplished the following tasks when he understood that he needs to have this one destination in mind. Jesus appointed 72 evangelists to preach the gospel. Jesus encountered Martha and Mary, and you know about that story, right? Jesus was teaching the Lord's Prayer. He taught multiple parables regarding the kingdom of God. He established the fact that he was not only the master teacher, the master, the the miracle, miracle worker, but he was, he is the Son of God. He established where the kingdom is and he can belong in this kingdom. He purposefully took some detours, but throughout all of this, he has set in his mind his goal, where he will finally end up his final journey to Jerusalem, where everything will climax in his first advent. Jerusalem will be where the, well, it's the city where he will die. Every day from that time, as he descended Mount Hermon, he had Jerusalem, his place of death in mind. He was every day inching ever closer to that destination. And by the time we get to our passage today, in verse 31, Jesus says, See. Behold, he is making a command for all his disciples to know to now look toward Jerusalem. All of you are coming with me and you'll witness what will happen there. Not only is Jesus firmly determined to go die, Jesus is firmly determined for his disciples to bear witness of what he will do. Why? As we know in retrospect, it is so that they can be eyewitnesses of this death. So they can be proof that these things did happen. And 
the Old Testament has been fulfilled. When our King Jesus says he will do something, and when Jesus promises something, when the Bible promises something will happen, you need to realize this one thing. God is firmly, pointedly set to follow through with it. He is firmly, pointedly set to follow through with it. Now, throughout my earlier days, I was the last person from being committed to doing anything. I said to myself, you know, I'm going to complete this art project of mine, and I was 10% in, I would give up on it. Back in high school, I spent five minutes on my homework, and then, oh, looks like it's time to reward myself with some YouTube. Three minutes into my workout routine, I'm like, well, looks like it's time for a snack. But Jesus, Jesus is far different. Thankfully, far different than me, than anyone in this world. When Jesus said he has set out to do something, he is firmly committed. But what is it that Jesus is firmly set out to do? In the latter part of verse 31, he is firmly set out to do this. It says in 31, And everything that is written by the Son of Man, by the prophets, will be accomplished. He has set out to accomplish what the prophets have said of him in the Old Testament. He has set out to accomplish everything that was predicted of him hundreds of years ago. But we will find out Jesus not only pointedly determines, the next point is, is that Jesus is completely determined. In other words, Jesus is determined to fulfill every prophecy completely. Now, if you were a Jewish person back in the day, along with the Jesus' own disciples, disciples, they expected a king like no other who will reign. So when Jesus came, they expected him to be that king. They expected Jesus to establish a kingdom during their time and annihilate all those who oppose him. And within Jewish messianic theology, there included zero concepts of the Messiah's death nor resurrection. So, thus, the Jews and the disciples, they have not considered all of the prophecies of the Messiah. So when Jesus spoke of them, of a more complete understanding of prophecies regarding himself by revealing the details of his death and resurrection, they're like, what's going on? And yet in our passage today of Luke 8.34, disciples still did not understand. Luke 18.34 says, but they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them. And they did not grasp what was said. Disciples probably knew most of prophecies about the Messiah. But here's a question. How many prophecies of Jesus Christ was there in the Old Testament alone? Um, around 500. How many did Jesus fulfill in his first coming? The, the conservative number is around 300 prophecies fulfilled. What are some prophecies that were fulfilled? Jesus is the, the fulfillment of the, the Passover lamb, for example, and that's found in Exodus 12. Moses prophesied that another prophet like him will come back. That's found in Deuteronomy 18. Jesus was that prophet. God promised David, King David, a descendant of his, who will reign forever. And this is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Jesus is known as a descendant of David in Matthew 1, 6. David says Jesus will be made a priest of Melchizedek in Psalm 110, 4. Jesus fulfilled that according to Hebrews 5 through 7. The list goes on and on. And Jesus does not say he'll fulfill some of it. 
all of it. When I was a brand new Christian, I had this growing hunger for God's word. I saw someone else's Bible uh, that specifically had indexed at least 100 prophecies. So I opened up the index of that Bible and I compared all the scripture back and forth during that time. Every prophecy of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, I was highlighting everything. My mind was blown. It caused my heart to rejoice and my eyes to weep at how much I missed out on the first 19 years of my life. I highlighted dozens of prophetic verses of Jesus Christ and noted which verses in the New Testament did it correspond with. You should have seen all the highlights I had in the first Bible when I became a Christian. It was, it was the most filling and delightful meal I ever had. More, more delightful than, than any Thai food or dim sum. By reading all of the prophecies, it caused me to develop an even deeper hunger for God's word. But what's the point? Can I encourage all of you this week to simply Google all the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus? And on the sides, have your Bible open with a highlighter and pen. Every part where, where Jesus' prophecy is noted, you highlight it, and then you, on the side with the pen, note the verse uh, where it's fulfilled in the New Testament. That would be called a feast. But apparently, disciples did not know all the prophecy, specifically about Jesus' death. This king will die? The very king we expect to rule will die? The king who is also the Messiah, who is also God, this person, this man, will pass away? Now, this was not the first time Jesus predicted his own death. The first time Jesus predicted his death was back in Luke 9, 21 through 22, where Peter knew that Jesus is the Son of God. But Peter did not understand what Jesus was fully saying, so Peter rebuked him. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. The next time Jesus predicted his death was found in Mark chapter 9. The disciples again did not understand. Every time Jesus predicted his death, Disciples did not understand, yet they followed him. Some of them all the way to beneath the cross. This is instructive to us as believers. When you do not understand God in your situation or in the Bible, the question is, do you reject God immediately? Do you get angry at what God has said like Peter did. When you do not understand God, do you twist God's word to make it fit your own understanding? It's okay to ask questions and do your best to find answers, but do you ultimately say, well, I don't understand right now. I'll still follow you. Because what I, under what I do understand is that you have set your love on me and everything that you do and say it's for good. So the disciples did not fully understand, or, the, uh, or they did not understand the prophecies, but Jesus knew of this. And this made me emotional when I studied these next two verses. Jesus knew about his death, and Jesus describes just how much he knew. If you know exactly where and how you'll die, and you knew every gruesome detail of your death, what would you have done? Let's say this whole virus pandemic is over. It's been months since you and your family have gotten a haircut. 
So you go to the barbers with all of your hair flowing one of what longer than right now. Some of you probably uh, would be wearing a man bun at that time. And out of nowhere, the moment you and your family ste step out of the car, someone would point a gun at your children. In reaction, you step in front of your children as a stranger pulls the trigger. However, if you have been forewarned by a trusted source that today, that many months from now, that you and your family may be killed, will be killed by a stranger outside of this specific barbershop, what would you do? You would probably be scared, right? You'll be thinking about this moment over and over again. It may stress you out. You would say, yeah, let's stay in, in our homes for a while longer. Uh, we've lasted the coronavirus, can last these next few months as well. Let's do everything we can to avoid that particular barbershop for a few weeks, you know, just to be safe. But let's see what Jesus does, having known his death in detail for countless, countless years. The next point is Jesus is knowingly determined. This is found in verses 32 through 33. Verse 32 says, For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. How much did Jesus know according to this section? How much did Jesus know? He knew exactly who will kill him the Gentiles, the Roman government. He knew all the acts of what they will do in detail. He knew he will be mocked. He'll be shamefully treated. He'll be spit upon. And he knew this was Old Testament prophecy written around 700 years ago before his birth. There is one main passage I want to look at in which many scholars say when Jesus spoke in our passage today in Luke 18, 32 through 34, he was speaking of Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. I want all of you to keep in mind right now, maybe bookmark Luke 18, 32 and 33, uh, and the fact that Jesus was mocked and shamefully treated. And I want you to, on the other side, turn to Isaiah 53 right now. So put one thumb in Luke 18, and then turn back to Isaiah 53, verses uh, 3. It says, this is a prophecy. It says, he was despised, despised and rejected by men, and we esteemed him not. Luke 18, 33 says he was flogged. Isaiah 53, 5, it says he was chased, chastised meaning punished severely. Isaiah 53, 5 also says, by his wounds, some translations say, by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53, 7 says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Going back to Luke 18, 33, says he was killed. But going back to Isaiah 53, 8, it says, he was cut off of the land of the living. Isaiah 53, 9, it says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Do you just see how accurate these prophecies are? We'll come back to Isaiah 53 later. But what is the point? Jesus knew mentally the graphic gruesome pain he would go through. He will be flogged, whipped, by and for the, the very people he came to this world for. If you compare Isaiah 53 and next to Luke 18, 31 through 34, you'll realize Jesus is not 
not only knew the details of Isaiah 53, but he knew even more specific details. The flogging, the being spat on, the mockery. And he knew he will be killed. He knew full well that these scenes are all prophecies of him from hundreds of years ago. What are the implications? Jesus' obedience to God the Father, even to the point of death. He knew all along that this would happen. And while he knew Jesus was faithful, steadfast, regardless of the unimaginable pain he suffered in your place, in the pain that you contributed, he still faithfully loves you. Here's a question. Who plans the death? Was it the Roman government? No, ultimately, it was God himself. It was God himself who planned this. God, speaking through the prophets, planned this all along. This means that Jesus was in agreement with the other persons of the Trinity from long time past, that Jesus would come to this world and die. Jesus pre-plans among and with God the Father and God the Son as the Spirit to die in your place. God did not determine to sacrificially love you starting in John 3.16. He set his love on you countless ages ago. And what does he know? He knew of every single detail. If God knew his own pain and suffering in detail, how much does he know your suffering and pain in full, unadulterated description? Jesus is not a king so lofty on high where he doesn't reach low and know your full pain. In our times of uncertainty, Jesus is certain. In our times of not understanding, Jesus understands all of what is going on. And you know what? He knows your sin in complete detail as well. He knows every rebellious deed, every rebellious thought. Jesus knows you every time you've slandered, you've lusted, or you've hated someone. He knows every time You've chosen your idols, your lusts, your darkest desires over Jesus Christ. He knows that some of you watching right now have been turning away from him for so long. Every time a preacher says, turn away from your sins and turn to Christ, you would say, no, maybe tomorrow, maybe when I have more proof, maybe when I dwell in my sins a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. Every time your friend nudges you and say, turn to Jesus Christ, you say, oh, I'm too busy. Maybe when I think about this just a little bit more. And just like how some people back then would mock Jesus Christ and would spit on him, maybe some of you have done the same today as well. And yet, despite all of that, all of that, God has set his love on you. Regardless of how painful it was. Not just with the pain he had to experience as he, as he was carrying the cross to his death. God has set his love on you, all of you, knowing all the pain that you have contributed throughout all time. Just so God can say, my son has died in your place, on your behalf. Will you therefore live for me? He died so you may live eternally with him. He did all of that while being mindful of your every rebellious act. Some of you right now will say, well, I'm innocent. I've committed no crime against Jesus Christ. 
I can go to heaven on my own. But do you know what God says in the Bible? There is none righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Everyone in this world is born as a sinner. And God says, even if you broke one of God's law, you've broken them all. But turn from your sins and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And all of your sins will be forgiven and you will have eternal life with him. The question is, how many times have you turned away? For how much longer will you go against God and what he has commanded? You don't have much time. Now, in light of having full knowledge of this gruesome, shameful suffering, Jesus knows it does not end in tragedy, but in victory. And he is fully trusting in this. So the next point is that Jesus is trustingly determined. This is found in the first part of verse 33 of Luke 18. Let's all go there. It says in Luke 18.33, And on the third day, he will rise. Here Jesus is implying that he will fulfill yet another prophecy in the Old Testament, his resurrection. Let's go back to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53.9-10. It says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. According to this verse, what happens when God the Father crushes his son? What will happen when the son makes an offering for the guilt of mankind? God the Father will see God the Son still. And God the Father will prolong his days. Jesus trusted in the fact that he would physically, in bodily form, rise from the dead. How does Jesus have this kind of confidence that he will rise? Because this resurrection was a triune effort. And that all three persons of the Godhead participated in resurrecting God the Son. We see in Acts 2, 32 through 33, it is revealed that God the Father resurrected the Son. In Romans 8, 11, Paul says the Holy Spirit resurrected the Son. In John 2, 18 through 19, and John 10, 18, Jesus says by his own power, he will rise. This implies that Jesus Christ completely trusted in God, and the Father, and God the Spirit. And he had confidence in his power. And Christ trusted in what the Old Testament revealed about his own resurrection. Here's a question. Do you have the same trust in God? In that Jesus Christ physically, bodily rose from the dead. Because if you believe that in your heart, if you tr fully trust that fact, then the Apostle Paul says in Romans, you will be saved. Because Jesus implicitly trusts in the Father and the Spirit's power in this passage, can you trust God and his power right now, today, in your situation, whether you understand it or not? Will you trust in the power of God? If you believe in God's mighty power to resurrect Jesus' dead body, will you believe in God's power to shield you, to guard your body? If you do believe then let any fear, anxiety diminish. So we saw Jesus was pointedly determined. And we saw Jesus being completely determined and knowingly determined and trusting determined. Finally, let's see Jesus in his unstoppable determination. This is the final point. Jesus is unstoppably determined. This is found in verses 34. 
Luke 18.34, it says, But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. What Jesus was saying about his death and resurrection was being hidden from the disciples. This is another reason why the disciples did not understand Jesus. Those information was being hidden, completely veiled from them. And its grammar, it's especially obvious in the Greek. But in grammar, we, we have this something called the active voice and the passive voice. The active voice means that the subject is transferring uh, the verb, uh, the, the action to the objects. So subjects, verb, objects. Mike is chasing, verb, the dog, objects. Mike, subject, chases, verb, uh, the dog, objects. Passive voice is the subject is being acted upon by the verb. So Mike is being chased by the dog. It actually happened once. I was walking down the street one day, and uh, minding my own business, and all of a sudden I heard barking in the background with little footsteps. I turned around, and what did I see? I see three chihuahuas chasing after me. Mike was being chased by the dog. Passive voice. The saying was hidden from them. What's hidden is in the passive voice. Who could be the one hiding the saying of Jesus and causing the disciples to, to not understand? It could be no other person than, than God himself. God is hiding, completely veiling what Jesus was saying. Why would God hide this understanding? If you recall, in prior occasions, uh, Jesus was speaking of his death, right? What did Peter do? Peter rebuked, scolded Jesus. And Jesus responded with, get me behind me, Satan. Satan influencing Peter tried to stop Jesus from dying and thus redeeming the world. The last thing Satan wants is Jesus to save all of humanity. And so... Satan did what he could do, whatever he could do, to stop it. But could God be stopped? No. To ensure that Jesus uh, will accomplish and fulfill all of Scripture, God put a veil on the disciples' understanding, so that no matter what, all things will be accomplished. Another reason why God's making disciples not understand is also to fulfill prophecy in Isaiah 53. But going back to Isaiah 53, verse 1, let's all go back there. Isaiah 53, verse 1. It says, Who has believed what, has, what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord, ha uh, Lord been revealed? The veiling of the disciples' understanding is also to fulfill this prophecy. The prophecy of no one would believe what has been heard. Especially not uh, during the time of, of disciples. And I will add, God prevented them to understand for our good today. Peter, in his own pride, thought he would understood. So Peter verbally scolded Jesus at first. Peter verbally scolded Jesus at first. But God ultimately stopped all of them. This is also instruction for us today. There are times... We don't understand what God is doing, even during this time. Perhaps God is veiling our understanding for our own good. The question is, even when we don't understand, will you, will you still trust God? Will you still have faith in God? 
Will you still follow him? Will you still follow him? And so, we saw Jesus in his point of determination. And we saw Jesus' complete determination. And that he is knowingly, trustingly, and obediently determined. And that no one can stop him. The question is, what can we do about our passage today? Is this your understanding of who God is? Do you believe in God, in a God that easily gives up on you? Or do you believe in a God who, un- who is unsacrificial, unloving, uncommitted to his words? Do you have any understanding of God that needs to be corrected? This kind of un- determination of God is not the kind of determination that any human can do. So the other application is we can praise, adore, and thank God uh, all the more. Another application is when was the last time you studied all the prophecies? Don't be like the disciples of Jesus' time where they had an incomplete view of the prophecies. Don't be under the impression that your study of God's word is ever complete. We see Jesus' obedience is complete. So the, another application is, the question is, how then can we obey God's word in light of what Jesus has done for you? Another application is, can you have a peace of mind in knowing that this is loving, that this loving, faithful, unstoppably powerful God is the God we serve, that he is determined to fulfill all scripture, no matter how difficult. Can you have a peace of mind that God is intending to bring good out of suffering? Can you have this peace of mind that God is intending to bring good out of suffering? Let's pray. Father God, uh, we praise you for this time uh, that we could look in this short but deep passage we, we praise you for the, the treasures that we can find in this passage. And hopefully, uh, Lord, uh, in light of this passage, our, our faith in you will increase. Uh, that we will praise you all the more and that, that we, will, we will go through this time of uncertainty with, uh, uh, with uplifted heads and, and a, a peaceful heart. Uh, Father God, May you continue to work in us and work in this world and bring about your, your plans that may not be known to us right now, but we may look back one day and say, wow, you did this to love us. Help us to uh, not doubt your power, your wisdom and your knowledge and your love for us. Help us to live in light of this passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.